Hey guys, welcome back to Voice in the Wilderness. I'm Dylan. Uh, as you can see, there's light behind me. We're back at our setup at home. Guys, thank you so much for your prayers. Thank you so much for your sympathy for our situation with our daughters and having to go to Florida to get them. Um, we're back home now. We're safe. The reason the video is going up a little bit later is because my three little girls wanted to play dollhouse and I had to oblige them and they worked themselves into a nap. So exciting stuff going on. Guys, I do want to um, just say something. When we see these folks on the chat that come in um, with different positions and they try to attack or call you a heretic or anything like that, I simply am going to say this. Okay, and uh, Bro Tom with Watchman River made a really good point about the mid and post trip position. Guys, the true believer in Christ is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And I'm simply going to say this like he said it, and I think it's a really good point for people to consider. I think that when you go to the text objectively, guys, and we look at guys like Polycarp, who was uh, a first century church father who had the opportunity to speak to John, it's clear they were all pre-trib. Uh, but with the Holy Spirit being inside of us, why would God pour out his Spirit on the Holy Spirit, his Spirit? doesn't make any sense. Um, so it's becoming more and more apparent, guys, that this position is attacked. I'm sticking with it because it's the scriptural position. And um, there are people on here who will come that disagree, and that's okay as long as we're civil and we show agape. It's so important. Uh, but guys, if you're coming in here and harassing people in our in our fellowship or you're uh, like I was told today that I was going to hell and that I was the reason that the saying uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So that kind of thing, guys, is just not acceptable. Um, we're not going to do that. The time is short. The hour is late, guys. And if you are a, a mid or a post trip person, I, I respect your your opinion. Um, but if you're coming on this channel just to attack it, guys, there's millions of other channels where you can go. Um, so if you're coming in here to have an honest conversation, by all means, I've done that. But as soon as it gets aggressive or starts to attack or starts to condemn people to hell, we're not doing that. Uh, there are so many other channels, guys, that you can go to for that. So if I start seeing people get real crazy like they have been and it's been getting worse the last couple of days, we're just going to hide you from the channel. You're not going to be welcome here. Um, and I hate to do that, guys, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, if you are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ and you're coming on here with that type of uh, venom and anger, then, guys, we need a heart check and a spirit check because the spirit of the living God dwells within us, guys, and that's not what he does. He certainly doesn't attack his own. Uh, guys, we can have unity in the essentials of the gospel. We can have liberty in the secondary theology that we disagree on, and we can have agape in all things. And if we can't adhere to that, then, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to move on. Um, so with that, guys, let me get some uh, documentation right here I'm going to go through with you real quick, and then we'll go from there. Give me one second. All right, so guys, uh, I had a brother in Christ that put together um, a really cool prophecy checklist for us, right? Uh, I did a little bit of one before. We're going to do another one today. We talked about in the, the video that's uh, the convergence video, we talked a little bit about it, but then I have this one that is very specific, very detailed, very scripture oriented, guys, and we're going to do a two or three parter on this depending on how far we get. Uh, but guys, basically, you know, here's the deal. The hour is very late. Um, the rapture is a sound biblical doctrine. The pre-trib rapture is a sound biblical doctrine. And uh, I'm, I'm unabashedly saying it, guys. Um, because, you know, again, I'm not scared. And if the Lord has put this on my heart, I'm going to be faithful to him and share it. Because I don't answer to YouTube trolls. I answer to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Christ Jesus, who sits on the throne in heaven, who's coming back for me very soon. Uh, and he's coming back for everyone who is born again. And what I mean by that, guys, is uh, you've put your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, guys. Um, you know, the Word says that if we acknowledge with our lips, right, and we, uh, we confess Him, and we believe on the name of Jesus as the propitiation, the payment for our sins, guys, that He comes into us and we're saved. Um, guys, it's important that we understand that. And so with that, guys, the born-again believer in Jesus Christ has nothing to worry about the tribulation. Okay, nothing to worry about. Um, we'll be out of here. And I get that upsets people. And uh, again, as respectfully as I can, if you guys uh, who are coming on here to stir division and hate, you know, we'll kick you out. Sorry. The time is short and it's ugly for uh, non-believers to see that. So we're not going to be doing that. And I hope that um, I hope that, that is something that we can all agree on, that if we can disagree respectfully and in agape, 
uh, but the condemning people to hell and, and calling people heretics, that's just not going to fly. So with that, guys, we're looking at um, 17 distinctly different points of why I believe the rapture could be this year. Now, I've already talked about the SGG summit. I've already talked about this BRICS meeting. We've already talked about CBDCs. We'll, we'll go over a little bit more of that uh, today, and we'll use some scriptures to kind of talk about what that looks like, and we'll talk about the status. Has it been fulfilled? Is it being fulfilled, or is it being restrained by the Holy Spirit? Um, and so we'll get into it. We'll talk about it. And again, guys, I want to make this point again is that you can uh, you can have your own opinion. I'm not here to convince anybody, guys, but the Lord has put this on my heart. The hour is short, and we're going to be faithful to him, Okay. So, uh, I'm going to read this letter. My brother in Christ made a really great introduction, and so we're going to read this, and we're going to start going through everything prophetically that's going on. Okay, so, take a drink real quick. Okay, so, uh, and for the record, this is an Aldi energy drink, just so no one gets upset with me for what I have in my can, <laughs> because you'd be surprised, man. It's been a, it's been a pretty crazy week in terms of the comment section. Okay, so he writes this. He says, Dear Reader, so much is happening today and so quickly that it warrants a review of biblical statements to look for when the day of the Lord approaches. A very key prophecy is seen in Daniel 9.27. This statement alone has four specific requirements that must be met. You'll see as you read through this paper that all four will be fulfilled to September 19th, 2023. Crazy. The purpose of this for you is to objectively decide if the rapture of prophecies spoken about in the Bible are have and are soon to be fulfilled. I provide 17 specific Bible prophecies that identify the current situation and then show or state how they are fulfilled. I may have missed some, but do we really need more? We are instructed to watch so as to know the time and not be caught unaware. I don't believe this is only a suggestion. I personally have to be careful not to inject past events that cause doubts and create fears that may block me from seeing things for what they are today. I mustn't become a Pharisee and refuse to look at the clear evidence that God gives me. It's okay to be excited when you see things talked about in the Bible. Shouting is permitted. Does God like to play jokes on his children, us, the believer? Does he like to make prophecies, set them up at a point in time that specifically meets what he says, only to say, just kidding? Does that sound like the God of the Bible and your eternal father? Matthew 7:11 says this, If then you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And Luke 11:13. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Could God set up a situation that fulfills so many prophetic utterances of a single event and then have that event pass? Yes, but why would He do that when He tells us to watch for what He has said, and we will not be surprised? I don't know about you, but I will be surprised if the rapture doesn't happen given all the rapture prophecy boxes checked. I really don't think that that's the surprise He was talking about. Now, many of this say this can't be the covenant because it's not about Israel or Israel's peace and there's no mention of a third temple. First, the Bible never says the covenant will be enforced, that, it, that it'll be about Israel, nor will it be about Israel's peace. It is with many. Second, there is no prophecy anywhere that says the tribulation cannot start unless there's the third temple agreement. The only thing we know for sure from the Bible is that the Antichrist will desecrate the Holy of Holies, the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation. This means the third temple was up and running before this time, but it does not indicate when it becomes up and running. And, please understand this, the enforcing, and the Hebrew guys for that word is gebar, which literally means to strengthen an existing. Uh, Pastor J.D. Farag has made a great point, even in Hebrew, guys, that word gebar is literally to strengthen an existing. And I encourage you to check that out. Back to the letter. Uh, the enforcing of the agreement in Daniel 9.27 is the act that begins the seven-year tribulation. This 70 week of Daniel is all about Israel from God's perspective, just like the prior 69 weeks were. One last thing I've referenced, referenced some entries. Please know there are way more references that I could have cited, but in the end, the message would not have been enhanced. Please take it upon yourself to add it to the reference provided. God bless you and may the Holy Spirit lead you in all things. So, guys, what happens a lot of the time, and I'm going to go back to my high tech uh, display prosthesis here, okay? is we can get tunnel vision. Okay? And we can look at things as an isolated position. That's a sad face. You can tell there's two eyeballs, guys, and then there's the tunnel vision. Okay? 
That's not how God sees things. Okay, God sees them from his perspective. So instead of locking on, he sees the whole, right? And we'll just say God is above all, right? He's above all. So, guys, it's important that we understand that God sees this from his perspective, not ours. And a lot of the times you find that what happens in the reading of prophecy and scripture is that people like to get their own ideas and it gets intermingled and they hold their ideas above what the text says. Okay. Now, guys, this text has been around, if we're going Old Testament, 4,000 years. Uh, no, I'm sorry, almost 6,000 for some cases um, because it mentions the whole of human history. So it at least has a 6,000-year account of history. Um, guys, the, the New Testament is going to be really close to 2,000 years old. And with that, um, there's a whole slew of our first century church fathers, guys, who all held this position, who all knew what was going on, who spoke firsthand with the authors of the book. And if they knew what was going on, they spoke to first-person sources, okay, first-hand accounts. I don't need some YouTube uh, pastor. I don't need some, some doctor and whatever to tell me what's going on. We have two things. We have the prophetic word confirmed which we'll go through today, okay? And we have written first-hand accounts of what happened. Now, I'm a historian by, by trade, okay? I studied um, to get a history degree. Um, I didn't finish that degree because it just was something that, you know, the Lord really shifted my mind and my perspective to go back to His Word and not, you know, the events of men. But one of the things they teach you guys is that you want to have veracity in your sources, and the closer you can get to the person who said it, i.e. first-person sources, the better. The more concise, the more clear. Now, with that all being said, guys, we're going to go into this, and I want you to understand something, is that I bring it back to the Word. My brother who helped create this chart, guys, he brought it back to the Word. He cites sources. So, family, if we're going to start getting upset, we need to understand that this is firsthand the Word. And we look at what's happening in comparison to the Word, and it's not a tinfoil hat conspiracy God gives us clear signs, and Jesus told the Pharisees his first coming. You can discern the weather, and yet you didn't know the hour of my visitation. Guys, you can look up, and the weather is pretty easy to spot. That being said, he's given us this prophetic word confirmed. We should be able to see what's happening. But we've become so blind, by and large, that we could put the word right in front of us, and no one would know. Okay? So let's dig into this, and we'll go from there. Now, uh, this is going to be basically all of these prophecies lining up at the end times. There's scripture here. We'll talk about the history of the current event and then what was met prophetically. So the first one, Isaiah 66, 8 through 9. Who has ever seen anything as strange as this? Who has ever heard such a thing? Has a nation ever been born in a single day? Has a country ever come forth in a mere moment? But by the time Jerusalem's birth pains begin, her children will be born. Would I ever bring this nation to the point of birth and then not deliver it? Ask the Lord. No, I would never keep this nation from being born, says your God. On November 29th, 1947, the United Nations adopted Resolution 181, also known as the Partition Resolution, that would divide Great Britain's former Palestinian mandate into Jewish and Arab states in May of 1948, when the British mandate was scheduled to end. Israel reborn in one day. Okay. Zephaniah 3.9 I will purify the speech of all people so that everyone can worship the Lord together. Hebrew is a dead language, and God orchestrated the revival of spoken Hebrew through a baby born to an Orthodox Jewish family in 1858 in Lithuania, which at the time was part of Russia. He was given the name Eliezer Yizdak Perlman. Israel restores a dead language and adopts Hebrew as its national language. Guys, that's incredible. That was a dead language. No one spoke it. And God used this guy to help revive it. Sorry, I'm getting a little dry in here. Daniel 9.27, and this is, uh, I'll go ahead and pull up the full verse here because this is just an annotation, but um, for all of my friends who like to deny the veracity of the word, I'm going to read the whole thing, because that's what we do here, <laughs> if you haven't found out already. Okay, he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. On the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. Okay. So, 
the theme of the 78th session of the United States, or I'm sorry, the United Nations General Assembly, including the general debate, will be rebuilding trust and reigniting global solidarity, accelerating action on the 2030 agenda and its sustainable development goals towards peace, prosperity, progress, and sustainability to all. So it's an existing covenant ratified in 2015, so it's been here for a while, by all UN member nations, with many, and pre-existing. It's strengthening of the existing guys. It includes all the UN member states, and it is a duration of seven years when they go to ratify this thing in September, which, again, too specific not to at least consider. You follow me? I'm saying, guys, that it's, it's too specific to at least not look at it and go, hmm. And just to ponder what it says, guys, it would be intellectually dishonest of us to look at this scripture and say, Hmm, this thing they could check all these boxes. We're not even going to consider it um, because it's not. And guys, there's a growing consensus among professing Christians that seem to be not wanting Christ to come back. And my only response to that, and I had someone comment saying that certain people fear monger. Guys, this isn't fear mongering. This is fact. I have quoted from uh, the Watchman verse in Ezekiel, guys, and we're we're required to warn people about what's coming. And here's the thing. I don't want their blood on my hands. So I will be faithful to it. And it's not fear-mongering. It's preparation, guys. Because the only people scared to meet Jesus are people not ready to meet Jesus. And if you're not ready to meet Jesus, you should get ready to meet Jesus. Just easy as that. Okay? 1 Thessalonians 5.3 When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Now, in this context, guys... Right? They is earth dwellers in the Greek. It's people who dwell on the earth. We are sojourners. We're pilgrims. We're just passing through. Our home is in heaven. We're just passing through the earth. But when Paul says they, every time he's talking about unbelievers. So, going back, guys, this is directly from... um, This is directly from one of the agendas from the UN. It says, in this context, I call on member states to contemplate how we can undertake coordinated purpose of action to rebuild the international peace and security. They are saying the exact same thing, guys. And I don't really understand how we can look at this stuff. And we'll pause here on the prophecy stuff today. We have a couple of, we have like halfway through, I think we got today. Um, in a short amount of time, we kind of blitzed them, guys. There was a lot of scripture, a lot of prophecy, but you know, here's the deal. All of this stuff is happening, and we can't deny that it's happening. We can act like emus with our heads in the sand and bury our heads in the sand and act like it's not, but the world doesn't stop moving around us. Guys, this stuff is happening specifically just as the word said that it would. And what do we do with that apart from look at scripture and take it at face value as no jesus told us what would happen and it's happening do you want to be caught like the pharisees who were who were um i mean they were it was really a condemnation man when jesus says you could discern the weather but you can't discern the hour of my visitation you know when when we look at this guys that's what the that's what the body is doing by and large you know and i have just this to say you know what if the reason jesus says the Son of Man comes an hour you don't expect. No one's expecting him because everyone is so stuck in this world out here. They're not looking for him. So look for him, guys. Look up. Stuff is happening, and we can't deny it. And here's the thing. Regardless of what you think about the end times or the rapture or whatever, you can go back to Scripture and have a clear understanding. There are some people who it's thinly veiled Gnosticism that they say, no, I have a higher knowledge than you don't get it. Guys, the word is the ultimate authority. It's the spoken word of Christ given to us as a testimony of him. And if it doesn't line up with this word, guys, then it's a false teaching, and it's, it's from the pit of hell. And that's just a harsh reality, guys. But what I encourage you to do is, whatever you see, whatever you hear, be a Berean. Take it back to the word. Even when I speak, I give you the addresses, but you go look at them. Because, guys, we don't want to be in a position where we're allowing false doctrines and false ideas and false teachings into our brains. We can go back to the word and see what the word says about it. That is what matters. This word is truth. And if we go back to this truth, we can easily see what the lie is. Okay? So guys, my challenge to you today is to share the gospel with somebody. Okay? Whether you're going to a gas station or a movie theater, you're going to like to get some, some chicken wings, or you know, you're going to Target or Walmart, 
whatever the deal is, guys, you have a neighbor who's bugging you, you have a coworker or a family member or a friend, the time is short. Share that message with them, okay? Because when you do that, you're preparing them for what's going to come. And you're giving them an opportunity, guys, that as this rapture window closes, you're giving them an opportunity to get off the ride before it's too late. So, guys, share the gospel today. If I don't see in the clouds, which we could because, guys, the hour is very late, then I hope to see you tomorrow, okay? I love you guys. God bless you guys. And again, thank you so much. This community that God has built for us, guys, is beautiful and wonderful. And I hope I get a snacks to all you guys at the wedding supper of the Lamb. So I love you, and we'll talk tomorrow, all right? Remember, share the gospel, eyes on Jesus, and always take it back to the Word, okay? I love you guys. You guys have a great day.